Hi, my name is Mike Gaben, and welcome to episode 21 of my beta campaign. And what we see here is the Kerpalo, and the Kerpalo is on its way to a manned moon landing. Yes, it only took me 318 days and 68 missions to reach this point, but here we are. Um, and the Kerpalo, actually, you got a little bit of a preview of this particular vessel, easily the largest vessel I've built so far. Um, but you got a preview of it a couple of episodes ago when I demonstrated that uh, I was having some trouble with the separatrons separating or just uh, blowing off of those liquid fuel boosters every time I tried to separate them. And I found out in simulation that a way to stop this from happening was to actually um, turn off your engines and then separate before those liquid fuel boosters were completely empty and this is forcing me to fly this thing manually as you can see so I don't have KOS going or anything like that. Um, so the plan here is to simply wait until I'm like a second away from draining those liquid fuel engines and then yeah well you can <laughs> yeah that didn't work I don't know why that didn't work it worked in the simulation and now I got this nose cone get off of their nose cone yeah, that thing's really stuck. Now, thankfully, I'm at a decent altitude so that it's it's throwing off the aerodynamics a little bit, but not too much, but I really need to shake this thing. Come on. Oh, there it goes. Yeah, okay, so... <laughs> you can just look at all the debris back there. Oh, well, at least we're still going. So, I mean, that could have gone worse. That could have taken off the engine easily, but uh, no, we're still going. Anyway, the rest of the ascent went as per normal, and if you didn't uh, pick up on my sarcasm with the amount of time it's taken me to finally get to this point, uh, please note that I am being very sarcastic in how long it has taken me to finally put some kerbals on the surface of the moon. But anyway, just to, just to talk a little bit about the mission, you can see that we have our A-team of Jebediah, Bill, and Bob in this mission. It's nice to have the three of them together for the very first time in this campaign. Um, also, the way that uh, I've designed this mission, it's not following sort of the traditional Apollo style moon landing. There isn't a, a specific separate command module and lunar module. Um, there isn't, the lunar module doesn't have an ascent stage. Um, instead, what I have is uh, a transfer stage that will get me out to the moon and then into orbit around the moon. And then I have a lander, which has enough fuel in it to land and get itself back to Kerbin. Um, it is fun to build the Apollo-style missions. I, I, I actually highly recommend building something like that. They're, they're really very, very satisfying. But as far as doing this cheaply and economically, uh, I think this is the better way to go. So we're going to do our standard transfer to the moon. We're going to uh, aim to go, up, go around the moon in a prograde direction uh, and have our closest approach to the moon uh, be at about 12 kilometers, nice and low, so that uh, that will make our, in, our orbital insertion uh, a little bit cheaper, the lower that you can get. Um, one thing we do want to do is, uh, if you recall from the last episode, I have this temperature scan that I need to perform on the surface of the moon to finish off a particular contract. So that has basically determined where my landing location is going to be. So I have to make a little bit of an inclination change. So obviously this is done with a normal burn and it's going to be done um, you know, out in mid course. But the idea is to go into an inclined orbit so that the orbit will take me over uh, my landing zone, which as you can see is a little bit north of the moon's equator. So we'll skip right on to that closest approach. Um, you actually probably noticed in that previous burn that I actually had quite a lot of radial going on. Uh, you end up having to do that when you make major inclination changes. They usually don't because as you burn normally, you're not just pushing the orbit down, but you tend to be pushing the that, that closest approach outwards as well. So you have to use radial burns as well to kind of, you know, keep that... Uh, that uh, closest approach in around that uh, 12 kilometer mark which is where we want it. Uh, anyway so we're coming up to this burn and the the idea here is to um, burn in such a way 
that I'm going to leave the apoapsis still up fairly high. And the reason that I'm doing that is because I want to detach this transfer stage. I want it to travel around and then crash back into the moon. And the reason for that is that I have the um, seismic sensor, that accelerometer, um, and that, that has been modified by the interstellar mod on it. It looks like the standard accelerometer that you get from stock. In fact, it is the stock part, but the stock part's behavior is modified by the interstellar mod so that in order for it to work, you have to have something hit the surface. And you saw me use this a few episodes ago on Kerbin, so I want to accomplish the same thing here. So the idea here is to get a nice high apoapsis, then to burn a little bit radially to push that periapsis down into the moon's surface. Then we can detach. The um, transfer stage will then take about an hour and a half for it to travel around and impact the surface. And in the meantime, we can land the lander and set up the recording to record that impact. Meanwhile, I thought this would be a good time to lower my landing gear and get ready for the descent. So you can see that I'm using some infernal robotics and some modular girders to try and give some width to my landing pad. Um, also, to stiffen things up a little bit further, I sent Bill out with some uh, of those Kerbal Attachment System struts to try to uh, attach them and stiffen up the landing gear just a bit more because those hinges that you use with Infernal Robotics have quite a bit of flex to them. And then became time to begin our descent. And now there are a couple of miscalculations that I have to fess up to. Number one, when I was calculating the, uh, thinking about the Delta V required to land, I was thinking of coming down from a low lunar orbit. But this is not a low lunar orbit and it's gonna take more Delta V to get down from this sort of high eccentric orbit than just from a low lunar orbit. Uh, miscalculation number two was that I should have been doing this burn and planning my descent before I uh, put down those landing legs because in the amount of time it took me to bring those landing legs down and to get Bill out there to put in those struts, uh, my altitude had increased significantly which made this burn even more costly. So this turned out to be a very inefficient landing. Uh, secondly, or thirdly I guess I'm at now, um, is I couldn't understand for me why the, or why the target icon wasn't showing up for the landing spot where I needed to do that temperature scan. In hindsight, it's completely obvious why, because um, that icon would be at the bottom of the nav ball in deep in the orange part, so I can't see it. But that kind of messed me up. I was expecting to see it and be have something to kind of aim for, so I kind of botched the landing, and then I finally began to realize, like, wow, I am going to be tight for fuel. I'm just going to have to put this thing down and uh, hope for the best. Now, one of the things that is really great on Kerbal Engineer is this suicide burn distance that you see down there on the right. Um, I wasn't confident enough to, to bring that right down to a very low number, but at least gives you kind of a, an upper bound as to how, you know, how far you can go before you have to thrust those engines and keep yourself from smashing into the surface. A uh, very, very handy piece of information that's being provided there. Yeah, if that suicide distance burn number ever goes negative, you know you're in for a heap of hurt. Uh, anyway, this is now going at two times speed just to get the landing out of the way. I've got things under control. I can see the shadow. I'm beginning to see now the lights from my landing lights. I only managed to get two of the landing lights on, but that's enough for me to be able to judge the distance. I'm trying not to burn too much fuel because I know it, by this point I was well aware of the fact that fuel for my return was going to be tight. Almost there. And touchdown. But whoa, 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 don't you even think about falling over. What are, what are you doing there? Not sure why that quite happened. But anyway, we're down. And now it's time for us to do some flag planting and then some science. And of course, the appropriate person to take those first steps onto the moon would be Jebediah, so he's going to get on out there and, wow, I wasn't really thinking when I put that ladder on and that solar panel, that's not exactly well placed, but nevertheless, Jebediah is going to go out there and uh, be the first one to put his boots down on the uh, 
on the dusty surface of the moon. Plant a flag and have some appropriate words. Let's see here. Kapalo landing site. It's about friggin' time. And with that out of the way, it was time to get Bill and Bob out there and try and see if we can put together a nice little group photo. Yeah, let's let's turn off the uh, the GUI and uh, the interface and sort of just look at this. Yeah, yeah, it's a nice picture. Might just make that the cover for this particular episode. And with that piece of formality out of the way, I thought it'd be time to do the uh, seismic sensor thing. So we'll put Bob back into the capsule. We'll retreat or retract this solar panel, get it out of the way so these guys can get up and down this ladder a little bit easier. And then we're going to select the uh, accelerometer, that seismic sensor, and we're going to start a recording. And then once that recording is going, we're going to switch on out to that transit stage that we left out in orbit. And we're just going to follow it around until it crashes back into the moon's surface. Remember that you do have to be with this thing when it crashes into the surface. If, if you leave your focus on, on another vessel, then this impact won't end up being recorded because uh, KSP will just remove it and assume that it's been destroyed without recording an impact. So we'll wait here for the impact and then, well, okay, the impact has been recorded, but we seem to have gotten a piece there kind of bounced off. I, um, I know it's dark and I know it's kind of hard to see, but this is actually the decoupler spinning crazily. Um, wow. <laughs> oh, jeez. I, I, I don't, I, I'm not sure what to do. Oh, there's still some debris down there. Oh, that's a, you know, I, I'm not that anal about debris that's left on the surfaces of planets. I kind of like scattering planets with debris, but let's, let's take a look at this, uh, this orbit because I, I don't want this thing to be floating around and, uh, yeah, looking at it here, let's see if we can get this again. Yeah, it's definitely going to crash back into the moon. So that's good. So at least I don't have this debris floating around. So now it's time to switch back to Kapalo. And take a look at the seismic sensor, the accelerometer. So we uh, check on what we got here. And it's a nice 250 units of science. So can't complain about that. Now I had landed a little bit to the east of the waypoint for where I needed to take the temperature scan. So I thought first job would be to get out there and do that. Thankfully, Kerbal Attachment System allows me to remove small parts like the thermometer. So Bob's going to pick up the thermometer and he's going to head out towards the east to try and pick up this, uh, this last temperature scan and finish off that temperature scanning contract. So he flies on out there and uh, that all went without incident. Once the notification came down, dropped Bob down, took the temperature scan, and then scooted him on back. Now, the other thing I wanted to do is uh, take all the regular normal types of science, which did turn out to be a little bit disappointing because it turned out that I landed in the highlands and uh, I had already landed an unmanned probe in the Highlands and got it back to the Kerbal Space Center in, the, in an earlier episode. So I had already gotten a lot of Highland science. So that was a bit disappointing, but I could see just to the south, there was one of the Highland craters. And that was definitely within an EVA distance. So Bob once again grabbed the thermometer, headed himself out towards the south, got into that biome, grabbed another temperature scan as well as an EVA report and a surface sample, and then got himself back to the Kapalo. But the question still remained, with only 917 meters per second of fuel left in the Kapalo, could these guys get themselves back home? Or was there going to be a daring rescue mission that was going to be required? Well, tune in. No, I'm only joking. You're going to find out right now. Um... So what I did is my first thought was if I could maybe save a bit of fuel if instead of going into low carbon orbit, um, I decided that instead I would just kind of launch straight into my trajectory to go back to carbon. In order for that to happen, I needed to have my landing site towards the uh, leading edge of the moon as it went around Kerbin. So I did a little bit of time warping before, like, well, duh, like, um, the moon is tidally locked with Kerbin. Uh, my position relative to Kerbin isn't changing, so that wasn't going to work. So yeah, I needed to put myself first into a low lunar orbit, and then from there I could set up my maneuver node and see if I had enough fuel left in order to get myself 
into or into Kerbin's atmosphere. And it turned out, yeah, I could just make it. So that was a bit of a relief. So with that sort of uh, uh, problem out of the way, I thought it would be time to see if I could collect uh, some more low altitude EVA. So I did a quick look at the map sat and saw that there were a couple of biomes coming up. There were three biomes, in fact, that I could get. I could get the far side crater, some Midlands craters, and I could also get the east crater. So I ended up deleting my maneuver node and uh, went around and did an orbit collecting the low altitude EVA science that I could. And uh, then I reset up the maneuver node, burned it and got my periapsis down into Kerbin's atmosphere with a hole. 11 meters per second left uh, to spare. So I'm not going to have a lot of uh, maneuvering room when I get into Kerbin's atmosphere and I get into low Kerbin orbit in order to pick my landing spot, but at least I'm guaranteed that I can get these guys back down to the surface. And with this uh, actual mission, I ended up knocking off a number of contracts. So it was time to go back to the Kerbal Space Center and take a look at what new contracts I could pick up. And right off the bat, I see this uh, bring science data back from the moon's surface. I mean, I got a whole boatload of science moon surface science coming back right now so that's a freebie right there so I grabbed that one right away and then I spent some time taking a look at this Skylab repair mission which certainly sounds interesting so I'll have to get back to that but I thought you know that one looks like fun so I'll get back and do oh, that man. one and then finally how can I resist the ever easy and really cheap visual surveys of Kerbin oh, wow. missions so here we are with the Aristarchus and at the controls is Tom Plock and Tom Plock has no trouble whatsoever accomplishing this particular mission. So he flies on out, collects the crew reports over the waypoints that he needs to get, lands down in these kind of hilly grasslands, grabs a, was it a surface? No, it's an EVA report he needs to get from the surface here, takes off and flies on back and gets him back gets himself back to the Kerbal Space Center without really any issues whatsoever. Back at the Carpolo, we are using a couple of more meters per second of our precious fuel reserves to tweak our arrow braking maneuver and try to bring the resulting orbit down as low as possible. Once again, I'm using the trajectories mod to help me out with this. Uh, and then once that's all set, it's time to take the plunge. Uh, I'm keeping the service module still attached to the command module because you know I still do have nine meters per second of fuel left and who knows what I can do with this um, I don't have a lot of control as to where to land but I want to do the best that I can trying to get into the water and as close to the Kerbal Space Center as I can get and after coming out the other side of the uh, arrow braking maneuver I, I, I take a look at this and I can see oh she it, the Trajectories is predicting that I'm going to land right in the middle of this continent. And although most of the time you can land on the land without too many issues, you never know that one time when you land on the side of a cliff or something like that, and that's the end of your Kerbals. I'd much prefer to land in the water. It's a lot more predictable. So uh, I'm going to start seeing if I can use what's left of the fuel that I got. So I got myself back out to Apoapsis and... Um, pointed myself prograde and started to burn and after a little bit of this I finally decided to say you know what the heck with this uh, I can see that I'm actually getting that uh, predicted landing spot reasonably close to the co continent that's got Kerbin on it and I figure if I can get it as close as I can and then just use the aerodynamic properties of the capsule itself I bet you I can lift this orbit and get myself where I needed to be so I thought you know what I'm just gonna burn the rest of this fuel prograde and uh, do my best trying to use the aerodynamics to adjust where my landing is going to be so with the fuel all spent in the uh, service module, it's no longer of any value, so I'm going to uh, dump that. And then I'm going to adjust the attitude of the capsule a little bit towards the north with the idea that I want to push my trajectory towards the north so to hopefully get it closer to the Kerbal Space Center. And it's not too long after that that I begin to realize that I also need to bring down the altitude of my trajectory. I can see that uh, I'm traveling most of the way around the planet in the atmosphere according to the trajectories mod. So I start to tilt the capsule also 
downwards, trying to both at the same time push my trajectory north and down. And it's not long, uh, it doesn't take long of doing this before I start to see that the prediction for from the trajectories mod is to put me down into the ocean to the west of the Kerbal Space Center. And I'm more than happy with that. So at that point, I just adjust the attitude to a retrograde position and turn off the SOS and just let aerodynamics take this thing down. Um, this is also my first time actually using these real shoot parachutes that are designed for the uh, three-man command capsule. I do like the way they look. I like that kind of Apollo-style uh, triple parachute there. So, we bring ourselves down, we land without any incident, and recover the vessel normally. Not surprisingly, the science hall from this mission was not insignificant, and with it, I was able to unlock the node Advanced Metalworks, and in fact, this is the last node I needed to unlock. You can see that the remaining tier is completely grayed out, uh, and it will remain grayed out until I can raise the four million dollars plus that is required to upgrade the research and development center. So future missions are going to have to emphasize cash, not science, but those are going to have to remain for future episodes and we hope to see you then.